Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. This is Kylie Galubski, Executive Director of the MA Source and the IBBA. Glad to have you with us again for this continuation webinar, which I, I have to say, uh, these series of webinars are, are pretty much the, the ones we've had the greatest registration for. So uh, we know this is an area of interest. We know this is an area where there continue to be questions. And so the MA Source and the IBBA are working together along with great folks like Mike Ertle and Shane Hansen to answer your questions and bring you the updates as we know them. Before we jump in, a couple quick housekeeping items. You do have a control panel on your screen that you can click and drag around to your liking. There's also an arrow towards the upper left that you can click on that will completely minimize that control panel. And you just click on it again to bring it back out. There's a questions section on your panel and you can type your questions in there. We have a bunch of questions that were pre-submitted uh, that we're going to go through. Um, Shane's actually prepared some slides that I think are going to answer many of those. Uh, and then we do have your pre-submitted questions. But um, go ahead, if you still have a question, type it in there, and we'll leave some time at the end to go through some more of them. And uh, you know, if you weren't on our first webinar and, and maybe um, are not completely up to speed on Kind of where things stand with this. I'm going to do, you know, a less than a minute recap um, of some things that um, we know that there are a lot of basic questions around, and there tend to be some misunderstandings regarding. So the first is that um, these webinars, the information we're providing you with, is not to be considered legal advice. There are many layers. There's lots of complexity here, things going on. So this, in and of itself, is not considered legal advice. Um, also a reminder that what we're talking about goes into effect at the federal level March 29th. And then we know that there's also sort of the whole layer and question of the state level, which Shane will get into uh, for us. Also, this changes nothing about real estate laws. So we've seen many of your questions come in, you know, how does this Im impact my, my real estate license that I'm required to have? Then there is no change. If your state requires you to maintain a real estate license, you still need that real estate license. Also, we know that there's a little bit of confusion sometimes because the law itself uses the term M&A broker. And we just want to clarify that um, in our vernacular, just, just think of that as business intermediary. If you are in, involved in brokering a business for sale that falls into the type of transactions that we're here talking about, then this law applies. So don't get caught up in the fact that that the law so happened to use the term, you know, M&A advisor or broker in its language. Um, many of you have asked, you know, where can I get the text of the law? Um, where are the list of states? Um, where's the summary of the key provisions? All of that you can find on both the M&A source and the IBBA websites. Both of them have a legal updates page. So to the degree that you have those questions, just know that's where those resources reside. And you will also find the recording of our first webinar last month, as well as this webinar's recording um, as we have it finished. And those are the websites to which we will continue to post any additional resources or updates that we have. Um, so with that, actually, Mike, I'll turn things over to you because um, first of all, again, just a big thank you. You are one of the many folks who have been on this issue for almost two decades um to to finally get a get this across the finish line and this has been championed by the business and immediate education foundation or beef and is known as the campaign for clarity so again for our newer folks that are just getting up to speed on all of this um that's sort of the players and the entities involved and now beef and campaign for clarity has been supported by MA source ibba AMAA, you know, other groups and organizations uh, who had an interest in this subject. So broad and wide support for this legislation. Maybe you can just add a few more minutes in talking about beef, its, pers its purpose, its mission, and this journey. Well, thank you, Kyleen. Um, uh, pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, the Business Intermediary Education Foundation was formed uh, several years ago by some voluntary contributions from uh, some founding members who felt that there needed to be an industry-wide resource to educate and create awareness of what business brokers do and uh, 
uh, the value they create for their their clients and for the community. Uh, and the campaign for clarity started independently, but it but it very quickly became clear that it was an industry wide campaign. And BIEF stepped in and agreed to help raise money to keep the campaign uh, moving forward to the uh, to today's date, where we've actually gotten a federal law passed that uh, dramatically uh, clarifies when does an MA advisor have to have a securities license. I should point out that we've been working on this for about 16 years, and that early, as early as 2004 and 2005, uh, some of the leading industry associations were concerned about how this affected their members. AMAA was actually looking to create a broker dealership to support its members who might need to have a securities license. IBBA had initiated uh, an effort with a, an attorney to get the first no action letter uh, issued by the SEC in 2006, the CBI no action letter. Uh, and uh, we've been really working since then to try to clarify when does a business intermediary really need to have a, a, a securities license. So with that, uh, we're pleased to announce that we did get a bill passed the end of the year. It takes effect March the 29th. And uh, Shane, can I'm going to transfer it to you to tell you more about it. Okay, Mike, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Kyleen. And uh, thank you all for joining the program today. Um, uh, it is uh, new for the industry to learn about this, and we know you've got lots of questions. We'll try to, in the recap of these slides, kind of cover the things that have most commonly come up um, in the presentations that we've given on this topic. Um, and we'll pause after each of these bullet points in the presentation to allow a little more interaction. Um, and, and actually, Kyleen, if you can read questions that pop up in the, in the questions or chat, um, I can probably easier respond to them and we can get through them a little quicker. But we'll cover today uh, what is the new federal M&A broker exemption as Kyleen noted, M&A broker is simply the, the handle that we used to describe the whole range of M&A re related consultations, advice, exit planning. Some go on to broker or act as an intermediary. It covers all of that. And it covers basically all of the kinds of legal structures that an M&A transaction might take. So everything from a stock purchase and sale to a merger to a, uh, a recapitalization where there's a change of ownership to uh, business combinations, uh, it really is designed to cover the waterfront. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, we'll then turn to the states um, and just the the uh, spoiler alert, we've got 20 states on board, but that does leave 30 to go. We'll talk about FINRA. How does FINRA apply? I, I could tell you there's a, a lot of folks who completely misunderstand FINRA's role in regulation. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. And uh, we'll also talk about what is a, an M&A broker to do? We'll talk about what registered registered broker dealers, uh, firms should think about doing. We'll talk about what it, registered professionals uh, may think about doing and what unregistered firms and unregistered intermediaries can think about doing. So we'll, we'll kind of try to talk through some of the, the points uh, along those what am I to do type questions. We'll also talk about what's left to do, and that's primarily the states, but, but also a little bit of fundraising. So uh, we'll circle back to Mike on that. And then we want to leave time for answering your questions, those that have been posed um, and uh, in, in others that may pop up. Finally, the appendix to this slide deck actually has the text of the exemption, um, and so you'll have that available. It's pretty straightforward, um, it, it, uh, and we'll talk about the different parts of it. So with that, um, we'll dig in. Um, 
Part one here, we're going to talk about the federal M&A broker exemption. This is an amendment to the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. That's federal law. And what the exemption did, or the amendment did, was create an exemption from registration. Um, if the qualifications of the private company uh, and the M&A broker are satisfied, um, the M&A broker can rely on this exemption from registration. If the transaction involves securities, it's still a securities deal, um, and federal and state anti-fraud prohibitions still apply. The SEC's jurisdiction still applies. You just don't have to be registered as or with a broker-dealer to be an intermediary or consult or advise about uh, these qualifying private company M&A transactions that involve securities. None of what we're going to talk about today has any impact on transactions structured as purely cash for assets. There's no securities involved in those kinds of transactions. None of this applies to that. Um, and so those non-securities transactions are, are simply unaffected. They, they never were subject to federal securities laws because they don't involve securities. So. Lastly, key point here is this is talking about M&A. It is not and does not cover capital raising. Um, you still need to be registered as or with a broker dealer to be engaged in capital raising that is outside of the, the M&A context. The, the exemption largely codifies the 2014 S. SEC staff no action letter um, and because the no action letter is uh, a little different than the statute uh, the no action letter very likely will eventually be withdrawn by the SEC staff and in the key difference and why it's probably will be withdrawn is that there are size caps in the legislation in the new law on the target company, and we'll talk about those. Um, but the, the size caps were a political uh, consideration in getting this law passed because we knew we would face, and we did, opposition from the Wall Street type investment banking firms um, because they like their barriers to entry uh, into their business. And, and so the no action letter, while it has no size caps, um, uh, would have been impossible to pass as a matter of law without having these size caps in here. Again, to emphasize securities laws in a securities transaction still apply. SEC jurisdiction, all anti-fraud prohibitions, uh, material misstatements, material omissions of information, all of those prohibitions still apply. This is simply an exemption from having to be registered as or with a broker dealer. And then important to note, and we'll talk about it, state level broker dealer exemptions are still needed in about 30 states plus the District of Columbia. So let me quickly recap what is the exemption? What's uh, what's affected by it? Again, it's registration only. You're no longer required to be registered uh, as or with a broker dealer in in most private M&A securities deals. As Kyleen said, it's effective March 29th of this year. That's 90 days after the amendment became law. That is to say, when President Biden signed the massive federal funding bill for the federal government for fiscal year 2023. Our five pages were among the 1,650 pages in that law. And, uh, and, and the, there's a 90 day delay in effective date. Uh, the effective date is March 29th. Um, I would say the law itself has no stated retroactive effect, but it would be fair to argue that the statute codifies the prior staff no action letter um, that was published way back in 2014. That's not bulletproof, 
but it does help you if you were challenged for a transaction that occurred prior to March 29th, um, because essentially it was the, the law now codifies what the SEC staff had said was their no action position. So it applies to private M&A transactions involving securities, regardless of the deal's ultimate structure. And that's important because when you start an engagement, as you all know, you don't know what legal structure that is going to have. Um, could be stock sale, a sale or exchange of securities, um, or cash for assets where it still involves securities. Um, and, and as we've noted in some prior programs, sellers' notes um, and earnouts potentially could be considered securities under some circumstances. So purely cash for assets at closing probably do not involve securities and are totally unaffected by all of this, including uh, I know there are some questions around the prohibition on custody and that is to say escrow of earnest money deposits. In cash for assets transactions, purely cash and assets, no securities, those prohibitions don't apply under this law. It's only if it involves securities. So um, it only changes federal law. It does not in any way change state law. So as Kyleen noted, state real estate and business broker licensing laws continue uh, if they were on the state's books before, they are still on the state books now. And so you really want to carefully consider um, state level requirements and, uh, and exemptions we'll talk a little bit about. Um, scope, um, we're talking private company M&A transactions. Here is where the exemption includes a definition of the target company. The definition is in the exemption referred to as an eligible privately held company. Um, this is important because it has to be privately held. Uh, the exemption does not cover and doesn't protect you um, if the transaction involves buying or selling SEC registered securities. That is to say, this exemption does not apply to what are commonly called pink sheep public companies, companies that have a class of registered securities with the SEC and uh, so technically are public companies even though they may be thinly traded. Um, this exemption won't help you with that. Um, those kinds of companies might consider deregistering de their securities and essentially going back to being privately held and, and privately um, not traded. But if they have registered securities, it is not covered by this exemption. The size caps I mentioned, um, there are alternative target company size caps. There are two different metrics here and either of them, either or both of them, um, define the eligible privately held company. Um, and the two metrics are designed around the fact that some businesses have high volume, low profits, and others have high profits, low volume. So there's a metric of $250 million in gross revenues or $25 million in EBITDA. This has to be the book, um, not adjusted. Um, it's pretty common uh, with privately held companies for... M&A intermediaries to try to normalize revenues and take out sort of uh, expenses that are unlikely to be attributable to a buyer because they really are the incorporated pocketbook of the seller. Can't use those. You have to use book for this uh, because there really are no real uh, legally established parameters around what adjustments might be made. So you have to go by book and you look at the most recent fiscal year ended prior to your engagement. So you want to look at the book uh, financials and, and you want to look at their actual financials. Another important qualification, it needs to be an operating company, not a shell company. And there's two kinds of shell companies here. One's good, one's bad. 
So the bad kind are the special purpose acquisition companies, better known as SPACs, where they've been formed. Sometimes they are already registered public companies, even though they have no operations, and they're designed to be merged with a private company to take it public. That is not eligible for this exemption. The SEC has had all kinds of heartburn around those kinds of SPACs, and this exemption does not apply to them. Um, the kind it does apply to and very commonly are used in M&A transactions would be triangular subsidiary mergers. That's where the acquirer forms a newly incorporated entity as a subsidiary or an affiliate, and uh, there's either a forward or a reverse triangular merger so that the target company merges with the subsidiary of the buyer and those are okay um, the uh, exemption itself in defining an m a broker um, really requires three things that the m a broker must reasonably believe and the whole concept here reasonably believe is you don't really know at the front end of an engagement that these are ultimately going to be true. You won't know that for months, maybe longer. But in order to create this exemption, you have to reasonably believe these three things. Um, you need to reasonably believe that the buyer is going to hold a controlling interest um, and there's a presumption that the controlling interest exists at 25% or more ownership. Um, it's not exclusive. There could be other ways at a lower ownership threshold, but the presumption kicks in at 25%. So you could sell a quarter of a, of a business in something like a recapitalization transaction where you're taking out one of the owners and you're bringing in uh, a new owner who is going to acquire at least 25% or more and therefore have a controlling interest in the company going forward. Um, and the buyer, you have to have a reason, reasonable belief the buyer will be active in the management of the business post closing. The exemption itself says directly or indirectly and there are non-exclusive examples of how one, uh, the buyer could be either directly or indirectly uh, active in the management. Could be a board seat, could be an executive C-suite uh, officer, um, could include approval and control over the company's budget. These are things that actually came out of the SEC staff no action letter, um, and they're not exclusive but the key there is having a reasonable belief that the these two conditions in particular will be satisfied. These reasonable beliefs can be evidenced in a number of ways. They don't, there's no record keeping requirements in this exemption, but as they say, if it ain't in writing, it never happens. So you wanna think about it defensively um, to have some documentation that you're building, um, ideally, it, the front end, but could be later, um, that you're basing your reasonable beliefs on. So it could be in the engagement letter where you kind of generally describe uh, among the many kinds of transactions that could be contemplated, uh, you could refer to the fact that it, it could include these, uh, these things we point out that the buyer is going to hold a controlling interest and going to be active post-closing. Um, but it can be other documents too. Um, and in Florida, um, in particular, uh, and Mike, I'll just throw it quickly back to you. Florida actually enacted their exemption by lawmaking rather than rulemaking. And of course, legislature legislators love to tinker, and they did in Florida. Mike, what's the Florida requirement? Well, the Florida the Florida uh, law was changed very early in the process. And because they were on the leading edge, they uh, they added the requirement that the broker needed to do a, uh, get a written assurance from the seller and a written assurance from the buyer that the buyer would be a controlled person as defined by the statute uh, after the closing. So there are forms that have been provided by the 
business brokers of Florida to all of their members and closing attorneys in Florida have these forms and they get them signed at closing, uh, attesting to the fact that the, the buyer is going to be a control person. Got it. And and there you absolutely have, and you could adapt those forms for your own use and, and they're, not re, they're not required in other states, but nonetheless can be, um, it could be useful. Again, it's no specific record keeping requirement in any state other than Florida, but um, you, you, you really want to have some tangible evidence that you can hang your hat on. Not required, but it, it's helpful to have something to point to. The third reasonable belief is really those transactions in which the seller is going to be offered the buyer's securities. This would commonly occur in an equity rollover where the seller is going to be asked to invest some portion of the sale proceeds or the owner's interests as a seller in the buyer's um, entity post-closing. So in, in this scenario, and this is where you would, if you're a seller's, uh, on a seller engagement, you're really looking out for the seller's interest. So what would the seller want to see if the seller is going to invest in the buyer's company post-closing? And, and so this particular condition is designed and, and we, it was presented to Congress as a way of assuring that sellers are going to be protected when they're asked to be re reinvest in the buyer going forward. So the, the buyer needs to provide the seller at or prior to the time an offer of its securities is made. They need to provide the buyer's last fiscal year financial statements, again, actual financial statements, provide a current balance sheet within 120 days, provide a management's discussion and analysis of the fiscal year's performance. This doesn't need to rise to the level of a public company's MD&A, but needs to basically put a little color around what the financials say, and, uh, and must disclose material loss contingencies. So these are things that if you're representing the seller, you want the seller to know what their risks are in essentially investing in the buyer going forward. Um, and so this requirement, and again, as I mentioned, seller's notes um, or earnouts, um, depending on the particular facts and circumstances, um, might be considered securities. Um, there are ways of mitigating that risk, but Nonetheless, they could be. And so an analysis of the buyer's form of consideration um, at closing is still going to be important to, to figuring out whether this third reasonable belief is something that you need to address in, uh, in, in the process. Um, Finally, uh, important to note, there are uh, conditions to the exemption. The conditions really are the guardrails that the regulators, the SEC and the states, found acceptable in view of the fact that the, the protections of federal and state securities laws that really are designed to protect passive investors and primarily in public companies, but especially private and uh, passive investors. Um, these are the guardrails that really supplant that whole square peg round hole problem with federal and state securities laws. And these conditions are designed to establish some basic parameters. First one is that the M&A broker in a securities transaction, this doesn't apply to transactions not involving securities, but in a securities transaction, in the M&A transaction, the, you as the intermediary cannot have custody possession control over the money or the securities. So if you um, have a, an earnest money deposit, you really, you have to make this work, you have to use a third party escrow agent. Um, and again, this only applies in securities transactions. And, and I would say in practice, I think most uh, transactions that involve an earnest money deposit are 
very typically Main Street transactions, not middle market transactions. Be very unusual to have a earnest money deposit in a middle market transaction. So um, it's in that specific context though that M&A transaction involving securities, the M&A broker cannot have custody, possession or control of the money. And that's Bernie Madoff right there, is the whole notion that somebody could make off with the money and, uh, and that's the reason for that condition. Um, second condition, cannot be engaged in a public offering of securities. Now, important to note, a public company can be a buyer, but not in a public offering of the public company's securities. Still possible that a public company could use its registered securities, but not in a public offering. Um, so, and here, you know, the whole notion the regulators focus on is public companies have a whole body of federal law around the regulation of public companies. And, and that's just not something that an unregistered M&A intermediary necessarily knows about, understands the risks of uh, and all. So cannot be engaged in a public offering of securities. Third bullet point here is uh, another regulatory concern that the M&A broker or intermediary cannot be directly or indirectly providing deal financing. Um, so for example, uh, PE firms, VC firm, venture capital firms, um, <clears throat> they can be a buyer, totally fine, but they cannot rely on this exemption for themselves to take a success fee on the purchase or sale of a portfolio company that's gonna be owned by their fund. That's double dipping. The SEC very concerned about PE and VC firms who, uh, on top of all of their ongoing fund management fees, were also double dipping and charging success fees. Um, <clears throat> it lowered the return of the investors in the funds, and and the SEC's view was that VC and and uh, PE firms that. Um, uh, would be involved, you know, they obviously would be involved in the transaction, but they couldn't get compensated for a success fee. They could charge more on their management fee, that's fine, but not a success fee on buying or selling a portfolio company. That would be true for other circumstances to commercial banks, for example, that are providing deal financing, cannot also uh, rely on this exemption and themselves collect a success fee. Um, the other condition kind of echoes the ones I've mentioned. You cannot be involved in a sale to passive buyers. Rationale is simply that's what federal securities laws are designed to do. They're to protect passive buyers. So that's a, that's a guardrail that says you cannot do that under this exemption. Um, you cannot form or facilitate forming a group of buyers. Similar SEC concerns around uh, the intermediary going out and forming a private fund of passive buyers and then turning around and collecting a success fee. It's really a, a, another uh, flavor of the SEC's concerns around PE and VC firms who are double dipping um, on portfolio company transactions. And um, the, the last condition here is that the M&A intermediary cannot have uh, a power of attorney that would bind their client, a party to the transaction. This is important simply because it distinguishes a retail broker from an M&A broker. Retail brokers can put in an order to buy or sell Tesla shares and it will bind their customer. And this distinguishes that. Um, and it is an easy condition because it, it I've just never ever seen it where the M&A broker had some kind of power of attorney because um, it's the client's business that's being sold and a buyer. Um, and anyway, that's one of the parameters here. 
there are in the exemption some good things, things you can do. Um, you can be, for example, engaged by either the seller or the buyer. In fact, you could even be a neutral broker where with disclosure and consent from both the seller and the buyer, you could be essentially a neutral intermediary. Um, that's probably more relevant to Main Street transactions than middle market transactions, but, but it's covered. You can do that. You do need disclosure of uh, what the comp is going to be and uh, that you're you know, basically not representing the seller or the buyer and you need to get the party's consent. Here's one really important you can do. You can assist the client, in this case the buyer, in obtaining third-party financing. Um, you need to disclose your role and your relationships and any related conflicts. For example, you could refer a buyer to a commercial bank and you could, with disclosure, receive a referral fee from the commercial bank for the commercial loan origination that the bank will handle, um, but the M&A broker um, acts as the uh, introducing uh, party. Um, you do need to disclose related compensation and conflicts, uh, and that's an important guardrail. The other important guardrail is this does not cover capital raising activities. So it does not allow the M&A intermediary to go out and help the buyer raise money from passive investors um, or from others. Um, that um, it sort of bring your own capital to the transaction. The M&A broker can't be involved in forming a group or forming a fund and and can't get compensated for capital raising activities that requires broker a registration as or with a broker dealer um the uh, couple more important things um the compensation that you as the m a intermediary receive is not limited the structure the timing can be a combination of cash and equity or deferred payments um, the M&A broker exemption um, doesn't impose any conditions around that, so you're completely free uh, uh, with those in those respects. And as I mentioned before, there's no record keeping requirements. Think defensively. You know how do you prove those reasonable beliefs that I mentioned? But um, there's no specific requirement as to record keeping. Finally, there are disqualifications. These are sometimes referred to as the bad boy, bad girl, bad actor kinds of disqualifications. Um, this exemption is not available if the M&A brokerage firm, its owners, or its management have been barred from the securities industry or are currently suspended from regist their registration in the securities industry. These are essentially saying you can't go through the back door what you can't do through the front door. So if you've been barred or suspended or currently suspended, um, uh, you're not eligible to rely upon this exemption. And I would simply add to this, this is not in the federal exemption. But at the state level, it's entirely possible that state exemptions will pick up some additional disqualifications that are state specific and are that the state licensing laws or other kinds of, uh, of criminal activity that the federal law doesn't pick up but the, the, the states do. So that'll depend on the state and that's just um, something that every state will want to chime in with, with what they require. So I'm gonna pause there um, and uh, before starting on to the next topic of the states um, and see, Kyleen, do you wanna see if you've got some questions that that maybe jump out at you because I I think I purposely tried to answer a bunch of the questions in my comments 
anything kind of pop up that uh, you can see and I'll add if people have questions later that we don't get to um, if they're they're submitted to Kyleen on the on the the webinar uh, or emailed we'll uh, we'll try to build those into a set of Q and A's that we already have pretty well developed, um, and and that'll be an additional resource that'll be posted on the the website that Kyleen mentioned. But Kyleen uh, or Mike, any questions pop up that we should hit uh, at this point? Well, you've done a fantastic job, and I have to say we're getting a lot of thank yous in that I just want you guys um, to be aware of. People really appreciate you going through this information. Although I have to tell you, Mike, I've had one comment. He's wondering whether this this whole challenge has turned your hair gray um, huh. since, uh, <laughs> over the past 16, 16 years. So you have a friend in this audience that's having some fun with you. A uh, couple of questions specifically, and if you said it, I've been trying to keep tabs and like check topics off here, so forgive me. Are folks allowed to advertise now um, that that their transaction um that their opportunity is a stock sale yeah that's a great question kyleen and i see that in um in one of the question questions from the last program here's a really important point um it depends on where you say it because as i mentioned if it's a securities transaction involving securities and you don't know that at the front end when you're advertising on an email blast that is essentially a public advertisement, what you need to be careful is not inadvertently by advertising a stock sale, you've blown the private offering exemption for those securities. And, and let me explain a little bit more about that. Completely apart from the fact that this is what we're talking about is the exemption of you, the M&A broker, the seller is still selling in a securities transaction their securities. And if you advertise a stock sale uh, in an email blast, you have blown the private offering exemption for that seller to sell their securities because it is no longer a private offering. It's a public offering. And it's not been registered with the SEC, which of course is prohibitively expensive and would never happen. So the takeaway on this is don't advertise in an email blast that this is a stock offer. You will shoot yourself in the foot and could have repercussions for having caused liability to the seller. That said, when you put together a confidential information memo, a SIM, a pitch book, um, a teaser that is not blasted all over the internet, that is specifically provided and usually uh, with a non-disclosure agreement in front of it, um, a, a, a document that describes the kind of transaction that the seller is looking for. Frankly, that's part of that reasonable belief on those three points that we've talked about earlier. Um, and what's important is that that is not widely circulated. And that would typically not be widely circulated. You would typically not send a SIM or even a teaser that had company specific information um, without having a non disclosure agreement in front of it. And that non disclosure agreement reinforces the fact that this is going to be, if it is a stock deal, this is going to be a private offering of those securities, that stock. And, and that is fine. You just, in contrast, and again, and I really want to emphasize this, you just can't do an email blast. Uh, or post to a website, public website, um, that has no click-through confidentiality um, agreements or acknowledgements. You can't just publicly post that this is going to be a stock sale because you will have blown the private offering exemption for the seller, your client. And uh, but after you get a non-disclosure agreement and you limit the distribution of that kind of deal information, 
about the company, about the seller, about the kind of transaction they're looking for, that's fine. So I hope that kind of answers it uh, to beat a horse to death. So we do have a lot of questions that have to do with the state. So I think, Shane, if you want to take us there to that next section, and then like you said, we'll pause for some more questions after that. Sounds good. So the states, um, there are 20 states that through this process we have on board already. Uh, out of the 20, there are 12 who adopted uh, the uh, model rule I'll mention uh, next. Um, and there are eight of them that have adopted no action positions, uh, interpretive letters, very much like the SEC staff's no action letter. These are the states, uh, there are 20 of them. And the citations here are to where to look for them. Uh, Mike and I both have these and the the detail around this. And Kyleen, we can get you that uh, for the for the website. Uh, to this 20, um, we are aware that um, Nevada is in the process of rulemaking. Um, they're not done yet, but they're in the process of rulemaking. We're anticipating that Alabama will be. Um, and, uh, uh, and so there's a couple that um, are likely to come along. Um, I'll highlight there are a few states, we've not listed them here, a few states that have exemptions that are generally applicable and are not based on an M&A transaction. Um, Washington State comes to mind um, they just exempt private offerings, all types of private offerings, if the in buyer or investor, and, and to that I would add the seller, um, but is an accredited investor. That's a really low threshold in the context of M&A transactions. Um, it's not M&A specific, and you actually have to work really hard to find that because it's merely a cross-reference in the statute to another statutory section. So it's, uh, it's sort of following the thread through their statute to figure that out. But the reason it's not listed here is because it's not M&A specific. There are in, in most states some other exemptions generally applicable, but they have different conditions, different thresholds. Institutional investor is the, the primary one. Um, but the definition of that varies in the states. Michigan, it's $2.5 million in a corporate entity. Other states, it's $10 million in a corporate entity. Other states, it's $100 million in a corporate entity. I can tell you clearly, it does not apply to individuals, natural persons. So the 20 here, really important place to start because these are all, you know, I'll call them fairly uniform. There are exemptions in some other states that are not at all uniform, but may be available. Finally, there are a handful of states that, like Florida, the, the regulator felt uncomfortable in trying to adopt the, or adopting the model rule that I'll get to by rulemaking, and in fact, probably require lawmaking like Florida did. That means going to your governor, going to your state legislators uh, to make that happen. And, and so it's just gonna be a little different process in these other states. These other states um, do have available this model rule I mentioned. It was adopted by NASA. These are the other blue sky people, uh, North American Securities Administrators Association. Uh, the model rule adopted and, and, and promulgated would be a better way to say it, because it's not law, it's just a model that can be used by other states. Created in 2015, so there are a few differences between it and the final state of the federal exemption. And that's where we're gonna try to work with Alabama to, to try to freshen, update that NASA model rule. Um, and get to Alabama to adopt it. Um, we're just at the early, early stages of that. And that freshened model rule could then be used by other states that would, would very closely harmonize um, the, 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 
uh, state rule with the federal law. Here, let me really emphasize, at the state level, state and regional associations are really the key players here. Um, contact your state regulator first, as they say, if you don't get what you don't ask for, uh, and ask them, hey, did you know the federal law changed uh, effective March 29th, and would you harmonize your law, your, your rule or your exemption with federal law? Bear in mind, these are state employees. Um, great people, to be sure, but they're state employees. They rarely do something unless somebody tells them to do something. So that's why you really kind of need to look at reaching out to your state governor. <clears throat> Very commonly, that's where you'll also have a state economic development agency and your state legislators. And, uh, and, and it's sort of the pressure, a little political pressure, and I, as I say, some states may require lawmaking instead of just rulemaking. And Mike, do you wanna throw in real quick some comments around what Florida did? It was really uh, very straightforward. Compared to the 16 years it's taken us to get federal law changed, it took us about 12 months to get uh, Florida law changed. I reached out to the state uh, Office of Financial Regulation, and they told me that uh, they thought it was going to take a, a uh, law being passed rather than uh, simply a, a uh, administrative action by the office. And so I reached out to my own state legislator. And uh, like most states, our state is only in session for a couple of months out of the year. And it's fortunate that this, my state uh, senator was a business owner. And so he immediately understood why this was important to business owners. And he took the lead and got a state representative to introduce a companion bill in the House. And uh, by the time the next session of the Florida legislature came into session, they had a bill introduced in each house. They had committee meetings, hearings, and got the bill passed in one session. Uh, so it, it was not difficult at all. I was really, uh, gratified that getting something done at the state level was so much easier than getting something done at the federal level. Indeed. Okay, we're running out of time, so we're going to click through these a little quickly here. So, boots on the ground, the state and regional associations, you all have contacts with your state political leaders and uh, and even contacts with your state regulators. So, that's where boots on the ground matter. Um, and probably within a month or two, we, we should have that NASA model rule freshened into a form. It won't be adopted or republished by NASA until at least this fall. NASA only meets as an organization really twice a year. And their next meeting um, probably too soon is in May. And then their fall big annual meeting is in September. But we'll have um you know some and and we're you know happy to i'm happy to work with footnote be engaged by state and regional associations to help in that effort but um let me quickly turn to state licensing requirements and this is really just echoing what kyleen and um said at the outset state licensing requirements for real estate and business brokers and i might add there was a question about franchises States regulate these things under their own laws. Um, state franchise laws, many states regulate franchise brokers. Uh, and there are rules around uh, purchases, and purchases and sales of franchises. So that's all on the books. If it's in your state, you have to comply with that. Same thing for real estate and business broker licensing. This federal law doesn't affect that. Um, and we know that there are an estimated 15 states that, um, that do regulate uh, real estate and business broker uh, licensing, but have exemptions for registered broker dealers, if you're registered as or with a broker dealer. That's a state level thing. This exemption at the federal level doesn't help you but it is a consideration when you're thinking about what's next for you if you are registered, because if you give up those licenses, you might be giving up this 
state level exemption from real estate or business broker licensing. And, and this is a 50 state thing. It's well beyond the scope of what Mike and I can really comment around. And it's not at all uh, affected by the federal exemption other than um, kind of what's, what's next. Real, real quickly, uh, I just want to say we have slides in here around FINRA. Uh, FINRA regulation is really pretty misunderstood in the industry as a whole. Um, SEC registered broker dealers must belong to a self-regulatory organization. That's a stock exchange or FINRA. FINRA is the default SRO if a broker dealer is not a stock exchange member. FINRA's jurisdiction only applies to FINRA members and their registered professionals. FINRA's rules don't apply to you if you're not registered with a FINRA member broker dealer. So, um, so that's important. If you're not registered as or with a broker dealer, FINRA's rules don't apply to you. Uh, they may affect you, but they don't apply to you. Um, and again, FINRA registra SEC registration, FINRA membership is required for anything outside the scope of this exemption. That is to say, public offerings, capital raising, fairness opinions, and other securities activities. And here's a list of the FINRA rules that really are primary around regulating M&A transactions. I won't go into them, we don't really have time, but if you're registered as or with a uh, SEC broker dealer, who's a, of course a FINRA member, these rules would apply to you. So what's an M&A broker to do? If you're a member broker dealer, a firm registered as a broker dealer, you could consider moving qualified M&A practice that fits this exemption out into an unregistered affiliate, a parallel entity, it's not registered, but it's affiliated. Um, there are still some state level uncertainties we talked about. Um, and uh, conceivably, if you, depending on how the broker dealers does the restructuring, it might require FINRA approval. And I would tell you I've done that. So it's it's been done and FINRA has approved it. So that can be done if you're a registered firm. Um, you can, if you're a registered firm, rely on this exemption to pay a referral fee for these qualifying transactions to an M&A broker, a CPA, an exit planner, an attorney. Um, it, all, it has to fit under this exemption, but if, if it fits, the 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 registered firm can rely on this exemption in paying a referral fee. Um, what's the ongoing use or value of a broker-dealer registration? Well, capital raising and deals that don't fit um, under this, like public companies. So there are reasons if you're a registered firm to keep your registration, but, but you might set up a, an unregistered uh, affiliate. For the individual professionals, uh, again, registration still required for capital raising, pink sheet companies, fairness opinions, anything outside of the scope of the exemption. So before you just say, I'm done, I'm out of here, you want to think through what your kind of game plan is for anything that's not covered by this exemption. Um, and there are still these state uncertainties. And, and because you would typically be registered with multiple states through the broker dealer that you're hanging your licenses with, um, you don't have a problem at the state level if you're registered. Um, other considerations before you just check out of your registration, um, some FINRA member broker dealers are resistant um, to paying referral fees for qualifying M&A transactions. There's a FINRA rule cited here. That's what they hang their hat on. They don't want to pay anybody if they don't have to. And the compliance department of most FINRA broker dealers is also known as the just say no department. So um, you, you have res resistance uh, among registered broker dealers. Uh, and this is all new to them too. So uh, that's a reason why you don't just check out your licensing tomorrow. You want to think this through. Um, the other important thing is your, your FINRA and state exam qualifications that you worked hard to get, 
will lapse at two years after you're, you, you terminate. And that's because you've not participated in ongoing continuing education. And, uh, and so automatically they will lapse it uh, after that two year grace period. And you would have to retake those exams in order to get them back. So um, you can terminate filing a form U5 through your broker dealer. Um, but think about it before you do that. And also check your rep agreements to see what, what happens to those engagements that you're in the middle of um, that may be technically engagements that the broker dealer is sort of on paper handling. So you want to check your rep agreements for those. Um, finally, unregistered firms, and this may be a lot of folks out there, um, review the state level exemptions in multi-state deals. So you have to realize that state level regulation is triggered by it pretty much any, any state law is triggered by is the activity or are the parties in our state. And so if you had a seller in California, a buyer in Illinois, and you're located in Alabama, three states laws will apply in that transaction. Um, and so you have to think about where the buyer's located, where the seller's located, where you're located. And, and so think of that list of 20 states to see if you've you know, easily fit there. Um, but you could consider expanding your M&A related services with success fees. Now, if you've just been an exit planner, you could now rely on this exemption if it fits uh, everything we've said uh, to expand your services to take a success fee. Update your engagement letters. Again, you kind of hear uh, it's a place among others, but a place to kind of lay out the basis for your reasonable belief that we've talked about. And you can cite the new statutory exemption rather than the old 2014 essence SEC staff no action letter. Um, and again, you wanna look at retaining deal docs that support your reasonable belief. Look at updating your advertising and websites um, because now you could cite the federal exemption um, and you could have new referral relationships. Again, has to fit within the parameters of these qualifying private company M&A transactions but you could have referral arrangements with CPAs, business valuation appraisers, attorneys, upmarket uh, M&A intermediaries, downmarket M&A intermediaries, um, so the deal flow can get where it really needs to be. So um, before we go, what, what more should I do? Mike, here I'm gonna flip it to you. Very good, appreciate it, Shane. And thank you for going through uh, all the, uh, twists and turns in the new regu uh, regulation. Um, we still need to raise some money to pay for the legal fees and lobbying fees we've incurred over the last 16 years to try to get this bill passed. Here's a summary of some of the sponsorship levels. I think the next slide is a uh, contribution card that um, will be posted on the m and Source and IBBA and uh, uh, BIEF website and we would really encourage you to uh, contribute your fair share to paying the legal bills and leaving some dry powder in the beef the treasury for whatever the next issue is that is going to require an industry-wide response. Uh, but uh, th these uh, resources will be available on the on the website. And here's some contact information for Mike, John, and Todd, and, and you have mine on the, uh, on the slide deck as well. Here's uh, some links for other resources uh, for the, uh, the websites for updates, including IBBA um, and uh, M&A Source and, and others. Um, and so now, there you have it. Um, I, I wanted to try to get through all of this because I knew I could answer a bunch of the questions. Um, but if you still have questions, um, uh, you know, feel free to, to, to shoot them uh, across the bow here. Finally, I'll just note that the appendix, this is the exemption itself. Um, and, and the beauty of this exemption is simply this. It says 
in general, except as provided in subparagraph B, which is right below this, an M&A broker shall be exempt from registration under this section. So it's a sweeping exemption. You just have to fit within these guardrails, excluded activities, the disqualification we talked about. And then there's some key definitions about, remember I talked about the SPAC, what's a business-related uh, shell company, what is control, uh, what is an eligible privately held company, and, and what is an M&A broker? And here, actually, Kylene, I'll, I really will pass it back to you. This is a very, very broad definition to say uh, a broker, that's a statutory term in the 34 Act, uh, somebody engaged in effecting securities transactions for others. Uh, but it's broad. It goes well beyond that here, um, and it, it picks up all of these activities. So, Kylene, um, th there we have it. Um, well, Shane, remarkable job. I, I keep line lining up. Yep, you hit that one. Yep, you hit that one. I know we probably still didn't get to every question that's out there, but um, um, thank you for being so thorough. And I can definitely tell you, know, you've been looking at people's questions and trying to respond um, to where the primary um, areas of concern lie. Uh, I do want to remind folks that, yes, we will post this recording. It will be up on our legal updates pages. And Shane has also said that we can include this slide deck. One of the things that just strikes me is that, um, you know, none of us like to spend the time reading anymore. We don't even like to read instruction manuals or whatever. But I, I think folks really do need to spend the time and read through this. As you said, it's pretty straightforward. And I think in total, it's you know, about five pages when printed out normal, because a lot of the questions I'm seeing are straight answered if you do read through the text. I mean, certainly there are things that are going to need some interpretation, things that will take place at the state level, but you have to start by reading this text, I think. So um, thank you both again for being here. I, I have to echo Mike's call to action. Um, don't think that, you know, oh, this issue is taken care of. I don't need to do anything more or don't think, oh, everybody else will take care of this issue. To give some of you some context, it's been, you know, in total over a million dollars of financial um, input needed to get to the place where we are with this. And there's still more to do. Um, and so consider giving in whatever amount works for you. As I say, every little bit helps, and that's certainly true. The IBPA and the M&A source have come together and have donated a combined $60,000 to BEEF to help get things started. I know of several state organizations that have made sizable donations as well. Um, but if everyone within our industry just, you know, gave some, we can really make some strong um, headway. And, and we know that there's still more work being done. We want to help support the states in advancing this um, locally. And so a lot of things that Shane's working on these days pertain to that. If you ever want the latest and greatest, the first place again to check are the legal updates pages. That's where we'll continue to post anything that we get from BEEF um, in terms of updates on, on states uh, or anything pertaining to uh, the passage of this act. Gentlemen, thank you so much again. And um, hope we might even see you guys at our upcoming conferences in May. That would be wonderful. I have added it to my calendar. Fantastic. So, so bye-bye. All right. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Uh, until we see everyone again, take care. Bye-bye.